Sorry for this technical glitches, so there was some disconnection. So I'll just uh, start and uh, share it, uh, in the brief uh, till what and so what. So in this week six, what we were, what we are mostly uh, looking at is the uh, way uh, looking at how uh, we will be so the after the protein microarrays and then uh, coming up with the validation to the antibody based approaches of the reverse phase protein arrays and then finally uh, going on through the level 3 techniques that will be uh, starting from this week. So now uh, going by the reverse uh, phase uh, uh, protein arrays, so what I was uh, telling, uh, I was discussing was the, that uh, this study is a very comprehensive study that has been performed to identify the integrative analysis of this multi-platform reverse phase protein array data to identify the responses. So here uh, the technique, since you, uh, in that lecture it has been discussed uh, thoroughly in the videos, if you have, uh, if you have uh, I am hopeful that you all have um, it, that it needs a quite uh, robust and uh, quite uh, uh, quite robust uh, technology for <coughs> it needs quite robust technology uh, for so it needs to be the antibodies needs to be quite robust to actually validate so and in this reverse test protein arrays so the concept is that you have you have the cell lysate or the tissue lysate of the serum and you will print those in the slides and every lab has their own uh, setup for the printing those slides and printing those arrays and then validating it through antibodies so here uh, the steps uh, that would require both uh, the antibodies needs to be robust to validate so that it doesn't give a false response as well as your uh, proteins needs to be get printed uh, on it uh, without uh, showing any uh, without showing any response so here so you need to have quite a So you need to have a quite uh, robust uh, uh, technique. So here what they have done is that so that uh, your students, uh, your, your validations or your findings doesn't become any in-house uh, setup specific or a particular laboratory specific or a, uh, or any any setup but uh, rather it should become uh, quite uh, uh, robust and quite reproducible so what <coughs> so what happens is that uh, uh, so what uh, they have done so they so as i was mentioning so, so to assess the reproducibility of this rpp technology across multiple laboratories they developed and international multi-platform approach so that the integrated RPP data derived from three different research sites uh, so that uh, so all those laboratories would have their own in-house uh, binding uh, Lysate printing thing and their own uh, different uh, so here you can see that they have studied six breast cancer cell lines so why they had chosen six breast cancer cell lines is that too uh, taking capture all those molecular subtypes and what are the different uh, subtypes and the lineages as much as uh, those can be encompassed uh, can be uh, could be taken within that then the, the cells were absence of presence so that was their experimental design and then uh, they generated 108 snap version Lysates, so the lysates uh, were prepared and then samples were analyzed at each site. So, as I was uh, mentioning, that they are using the respective in house uh, RPPA uh, 
platforms and then which before that many stages of the the setup uh, so as i mentioned that the setup uh, used different methodologies uh, which before that many stages of the rpp analysis workflow including your slide type the number of technical duplicates and dilutions for samples readout time readout time scanner image analysis software and normalization procedure enabling the capture of variation between rtpa so uh, variation between rtpa platforms operated in different uh, laboratories so micro added samples were propped with panels of validated antibodies in routine use on the three rtpa platforms so as uh, i mentioned and the lecture it was thoroughly mentioned <coughs> that you need to have panels of the validated uh, antibodies uh, in routine use to enable the data set comparison all antibodies were assigned unique antibody and identifiers so each uh, antibody were given with the unique uh, antibody identifiers and then data derived from antibodies targeting the same proteins or the phosphorylated residues including different antibodies from different sub suppliers acquired on all the three rtpa platforms were used for further analysis so this was uh, for the further components so here you can see that the different cell types and the samples get <coughs> so the uh, variations uh, uh, that the, there is been uh, no variations in the cell lysate uh, preparation so that whatever variations you were so whatever variations you were at uh, going at the uh, platform level or you were measuring at the cell lysate level to negate that so cell lysates were prepared in one go so that those variations can be ruled out so only those variations that are coming or in the lysate preparation uh, i'm sorry in the in the variation for the inner setup for the uh, reverse phase procedure is that was so that was only captured it out okay so <coughs> so that was uh, only uh, captured it out so that's why the samples were prepared so and then Sent to them so with the different inals uh, setup of the reverse scenarios, uh, one can get. So these are the different cell lines and the different uh, and they are <coughs> different antibodies and the normalization intensity after the analysis. <coughs> so here I'll just <coughs> like to go through it is that samples were analyzed at each research site using the respective in house rtpa platforms for the tallies all biologic duplicate letters were seriously diluted to produce a dilution comprising four serial two fold dilutions for the edelberg biological triplet dc related to the comprising serial two fold so this, so this just says that they are used to different uh, dilutions as well so then they confirmed that data 99% data points is derived from undiluted samples then the samples were spotted <coughs> so different different slides and the procedure so you can see that this is uh, just i wanted to show that how they have used different procedures and then how they have integrated the data sets and uh, i think uh, the relative fluorescence sample was quantified that uh, software that they have used for the quantification of those intensities were also different like <coughs> sorry micro vision gene fix pro or uh, mapix So here, one person less than one person were below the lower limits of detection for all antibody antigens. 
so data set uh, integration so rpp data derived from all the three rppa platforms that has been normalized using the in-house normalization procedure of each platform so the normalization has also been done using the in-house uh, normalization of all uh, those platforms then normalized rppa data derived from each word binary uh, logarithm transform log to transform unless they were so transformed as a part of the uh, platform specific normal and stored as matrices of transformed uh, normalized uh, data points arranged in rows of different samples and columns. So, uh, just uh, this is uh, this is a just uh, normal basic steps of where you need to perform the uh, normalization and uh, uh, log transformation to uh, scale it uh, down. So, what uh, happens is there uh, that uh, uh, since you need to have a so since <coughs> you want to have a uh, normalization so if the you know normalization procedure included the log transformation procedure then it has it was not done if it was not so done then it would have it was uh, done in a long transform so so just uh, Part of uh, just again give a overview of RPPA and its utilization and what are the different steps involved. So, meanwhile, Meanwhile, I'll also be sharing. Yeah, so I'll just uh, I'll just go through it. So you can see that in the reverse press protein array. So technology application data processing and integration. So just I'll <coughs> like to reverse phase protein array is a high throughput uh, so antibody based targeted proteomics platform that can quantify hundreds of proteins in thousands of samples directing tissue or cell lysis, serum, plasma or other uh, body fields and cell measures. so just you get an uh, overview and idea that uh, uh, again revise the concepts of the reverse protein arrays. Protein samples are robotically arrayed as microspots on microcellular coated glass uh, slides. Its side is coated with a specific antibody that can detect levels of total uh, protein expression or PTM such as phosphorylation measure of protein activity. So its slide is always probed with a specific antibody. So here uh, you, you can describe the workflow protocol shortcut tools. So that they had developed and optimized for RPPA in a code facility setting that includes sample preparation, microarray mapping, printing of protein samples, antibody labeling, slide scanning, image analysis, data normalization, and quality control. So, as we have uh, seen in the lecture also, that uh, So 
there is a uh, seen in the lecture also that there are various data analysis data normalization techniques available that can be your total protein normalization that depends so in that paper also we have seen that <coughs> they have said that the in-house uh, procedure requires the uh, different uh, kinds of setup or the different uh, uh, kinds of uh, activities so but what happens is that uh, so that should not affect the actual uh, identification okay so RPP is a robust, highly reproducible, so that's why I give that reference that how people have shown that how it can be reproducible. That enables for interrogation of multiple protein and the functional status in the micro format. <coughs> the reverse order of arraying protein targets and incubating replicate arrays is with a single well character category, robust as fantastic because it enables use of appropriate controls. <coughs> and conditions for a specific RPP is a high throughput, low cost procedure compared with mass and is thus more amenable to rapid analysis of large numbers of experimental samples and without prefactional uh, success. So, in the uh, what uh, happens uh, in your mass spectrometry data is that you need to have some fractions uh, for the serum and all so that uh, your low abundant proteins as well as gets detected you can uh, detect it with small uh, sample volumes and amounts of proteins and it's highly sensitive capable of detecting low abundance so as i just mentioned now that detecting low abundance and the regulated proteins on the mammalian protein becomes quite tricky or challenging in the uh, mass spectrometry setup but it becomes quite easy in the rtpa setup because you are just uh, you know the antibody and you are just validating uh, those uh, capturing those so that uh, gives you a quite enhanced <coughs> so meanwhile if you have any doubt you can share here measured by mass spectrometry so here you can see that they have written that detecting low abundance regulatory proteins are difficult to measure by mass spectrometry profiling so because of these properties rpp is utilized to validate candidate protein biomarkers or protein pathways discovered by mass spectrometry gene expression profiling so rpp is utilized to validate your candidate protein biomarkers so whatever you have uh, got identification of those particular uh, protein biomarkers uh, so whatever protein uh, so, so whatever protein biomarkers you have got or you have identified uh, so in the pathways and all in the using mass spectrometry based approaches so what you can do is that you can validate those using uh, rtpa so rtpa is proven to be valuable as a discovery tool for identifying protein signaling pathways in cancer progression and pathways and therapy therapies are responsible for uh, respond, uh, resistance. So what you can see that in this protocols and in-house for RPPA that have supplied in code personally. So here is really that the sample preparation. So <coughs> you would require the cell or the tissue license then well placed slides, add a set of annual printing, antibody labeling of slides, more validated antibody per slide and then will be your scanning and the images. So antibodies, uh, so analysis, uh, they, so they are, they have mentioned about the manufacturers and all details of about what they have used in their study <coughs> the steps 
in the overall RPPA uh, workflow dictate uh, are dictated in the following sections to support certain software suitable for workflow. And comprise three parts. So uh, since it's a uh, tool, put in a set of data analysis. Uh, data analysis. Okay, so say this again. I am uh, repeating whatever uh, was also discussed uh, in the lecture uh, in a quite uh, uh, detailed way. That because uh, RPPA technology is highly dependent on the quality of the antibody, the key feature is rigorous antibody violation uh, validation for specificity and the uh, selectivity. Our criteria for antibody validation included an immunoblot single protein but a specific multiple band for protein isomers of correct molecular size. So they had chosen the correct uh, by after performing the uh, western blood. So the thing is that it cannot have a multiple band. So if for a particular protein or particular antibody it is giving multiple bands, then you cannot take that forward for RPPA. So, equivalent models, most of the validated comes from an inventory. So, uh, so, what uh, a single sharp band which is coming in the standard for a particular protein, you can take those uh, forward. And then, uh, so this is uh, for the sample preparation using the lipolysis, uh, <coughs> sorry, uh, RPPL lysis proper. Uh, which are being used and then the setup printed for RPPA side. So here what I wanted to make uh, the most uh, important uh, two points are that you need to antibody you need to first check that your antibody is performing is giving a single band and not giving two or three bands for each uh, particular protein and then only you can take it forward because uh, uh, otherwise it would uh, become difficult to understand that this your signal is true or false. Secondly the sample preparation and the printing slide. And then is your antibody and the total uh, protein labeling of RPPA uh, slides. So different antibodies, I mean out primary antibodies. So after the slide scanning and the antibody labeling and then the secondary antibody and then that's the so data normalization of each individual implant. <coughs> Total protein and 897 with specific antibodies. So, this the different normalization techniques one can use. So, raw SI, so <coughs> multiple PMTs calculate cell mix score and all data report, MC report, and the data analysis. So, antibody inventory. These are all the what they are made. So this, uh, so I just wanted to, uh, just uh, wanted to describe uh, this again. If you have any doubt uh, regarding uh, reverse phase protein data, so you can ask. Otherwise, uh, we can move forward. So I'll just uh, again uh, give a brief that so protein data 
is the major uh, thing it requires is the antibody the qualities of the antibodies so the antibodies firstly is you need to perform one uh, immunoblot uh, experiment or western blot experiment to target the uh, particular uh, protein and then only you can uh, identify that if it contains a single band then only you can take forward that antibody uh, for your particular experiment otherwise it's uh, not possible uh, so that you need to make sure again another thing is that the which uh, that seems it is uh, quite uh, reproducible and robust in nature so how uh, this study will I have given one example of this study how they have used in the three different uh, platforms in three different laboratories to make sure that the in-house setup or doesn't affect the actual finding of the results. So you can see that in the six different cell lysis in different uh, uh, in different three different platforms, the data showing the same. Uh, irrespective of the in-house setup of the RPPA uh, setup of the printing and the dilutions they have used. So this shows that how much it is reproducible but you need to be make sure of the quality of the antibodies and then uh, validation and then finally validating and also the uh, data analysis steps the, that also includes and uh, that is also very much in-house uh, uh, <coughs> so in-house uh, what you said that uh, optimization so next uh, I think in the lecture you have once to the uh, surface uh, plasma uh, resonance or the SPR so SPR is a platform which uses does not use uh, antibody uh, uh, labeling or any kind of such levels, but here you can study the protein protein interactions or the protein drug interactions or protein ligand interactions or anything interactions using uh, uh, in a level uh, free way in just by saying that how much the <coughs> refractive index gets uh, changes and on the basis of the light so uh, getting uh, reflected. Uh, and the sensor chip so this is so I'll just uh, give a brief and then we will also look at some the calculations So, just you can see that the surface plus one resonance. So, I will just also share the link of this too. So is a level which has <coughs> okay, so numerous strategies for have been developed. So I wish to bring about. Uh, so I think we will go through. So let us go to the general principle of SPR. So occurs when a photon of the incident light hits your metal surface. So here typically gold uh, is used. So at a certain angle of incidence, a portion of the light in the chip goes to the metal coating with the metal surface layers, then which then moves due to excitation. So these uh, uh, electron movements are called plasma. So it is generally used very much uh, in the physics, uh, various experiments or various uh, measurements. It is very much used and then they propagate parallel to the metal surface then a tensile electric field 
from the boundary between the sample solution <coughs> using a, a so here in a commercial SQL by sensor what happens is that incident light is employed by using a high reflective index glass prism using ATR or the placement geometry they defined at which resonance occurred on the conditions of the constant light source wavelength and the metal thin surface is dependent of the material near the metal surface. So when there is a small change in your reflective index of the sensing medium to violet molecule atom, plasmon cannot be formed. Detection is thus upon measuring the changes. So this detection you can measure. So when a light will be passed on to a certain uh, intensity, but when you will have some uh, ligands attached uh, to it, so it will create some changes. So the amount of the surface concentration by monitoring the reflected tracking the resonance angle shifts. So <coughs> sorry, in addition the amount of the surface concentration it can be measured by your uh, shifting the uh, tracking the resonance. Shift. So what is the detection limit? So you know that there are two types of limits that is mostly used. This one is in LODs that is limit of detection as the limit of uh, quantification. So one here uh, has helps you do just detecting, and another uh, limit of personality need to quantify certain things. So here the detection limit is in the order of the uh, ten picogram uh, uh, per ml. So here what happens is that in the SPR biosensors probe molecules are first immobilized into the sensor surface. So just uh, I'm just giving you the basic uh, principles that what happens so hopefully you can uh, visualize it as well so here what happens so <coughs> is that uh, SPR biosensors so probe molecules are first immobilized when the solution of flown into the contact a probe target binding by affinity interaction occurs which consequently induces an increase in the refractive index at the SPR sensor surface Okay, so here what happens is that a resonance or response units are used to describe the signal change where one response unit is equivalent to a critical angle shift of 10 to the power minus 4 degrees. So whatever response unit uh, or resonance unit or whatever you uh, find in the different numericals or the calculators, so there is one response unit or resonance unit is equivalent to your uh, ten, uh, critical angle shift of 10 to the power minus 4 degree. So what happens if when you have a immobilized probe and you just uh, with the <coughs> sorry so with the uh, targets uh, if you just uh, uh, keep on uh, flowing at different concentrations you will find out uh, that the, there is a change in uh, every response unit uh, so uh, so that's where you can identify that what is the interactions uh, level so at the start of the experiment whereas probe target in <coughs> sorry <coughs> interactions have not occurred when your probe target interactions have not occurred the initial uh, Sorry. <laughs> so when uh, so when you are just started to flow your uh, experiment where the target interactions the initial RU value corresponds to the starting critical angle the, the change in those refractive index arises with a lead thickness so this is the formula which helps your <coughs> calculation whereas D in DC volume is the increase of the refractive index with the volume concentration of the analyte and is the concentration of the bound target on the uh, surface. The change in the is tracked by the coupling of the incident light into a propagating surface plasma on a gold surface in real time. So accordingly you can identify the rate of association during association phase, the rate of dissociation when target molecules is removed from the continuous flows by buffer washing 
and the association rate constant and the dissociation rate constant can be determined by SPR evaluation of binding changes. So you know that whatever what majorly SPR involves in the identifying the uh, rate cons uh, that the rate constants that is your association rate constant or the means the binding kinetics you can measure the binding kinetics that how strongly your drug can interact with that particular protein uh, uh, in a SPR that uh, yes so that you can say that uh, yes that your drug uh, has too much affinity uh, towards that particular protein and you are very much sure that if you target uh, those protein for that particular drug uh, it gets associated very quickly and it's, it's difficult to dissociate so the, you will get the uh, binding rate so the parameters that related can be also used to detect and quantify the target molecules bound to a known probe immobilized on the sensor surface so here you can say the limit of detection in the experiment depends on the number of factors so including your molecular weight optical property binding affinity of target probe molecules as well as your surface uh, coverage. So SPR imaging is uh, something uh, different that uh, the combination of protein arrays SPR uh, level free methods. So I think it will uh, come in consequent lecture and we will discuss that. Right? So a wide range of applications SPR biosensors, SPR powerful tool as I told for the applications. I am hopeful that you were clear with the <coughs> the lecture also it was discussed uh, I thought uh, yeah. but uh, in the detail so SPR uh, the simple principle is that the, with the change uh, in the probe with the change in the molecule when it is getting associated the uh, target molecule with the solution in the analyte and which you have immobilized there will be a change in the refractive indexes and there will be a change in the response units and with that change in the response units you can identify that how much is your association constant or the dissociation uh, constant and then finally find out the binding uh, kinetics for your uh, protein protein or protein drug or protein small molecule or drug drug anything so enzyme uh, substrate reaction and your a bit of mapping yeah, so epitope antigen antibody so that particular region <coughs> of that protein would be the best as an epitope or can be used as a vaccine candidate or not can be used from that so real-time dna manipulation such as hybridization kinetics enzymatic modifications dna strand separation uh, so all this can be used then conformational mutation detection type throughput okay so this if you go through it you can find out the affinity so as i mentioned so all this can be uh, done through spr the surface plasma resonance So here some examples of SPR if we discuss one that can be used for the binding affinity or the KD calculation. So your dissociation constant KD is a measure of the strength of the interaction.
so here that the binding affinity that uh, which I mentioned of the KD calculation so dissociation constant is a measure of the strength of the interaction between a protein and its uh, ligand so it is calculated from the association and your dissociation with constants KD equal to KD was given if K equal to this much and then KD will be 4 by your nanogram then the binding kinetics as I was mentioning association and the can be determined from SPR sensograms using fitting models such as Langmuir binding or exclusion ligand binding models, concentration response curves. <coughs> you calculate KD given specificity for the interaction, competitive binding assays, effect of a competitive ligand on the binding of a primary ligand to a protein. So, more reduce the binding to a peptide 50 percent can be determined. Now, uh, let us look at one question or one numerical based on that. So, if you want to immobilize a small molecule ligand on an SPR sensor strip and you use it to study its binding to a protein, we want to achieve an R max value of 2000 value that is a resonance units or the response units, and we have some uh, preliminary data. So, that this KD is 10 nanomolar, so KD by K that is. Uh, that is 10 nanomolar molecular weight of the protein is 50 kilo dalton and molecular weight of the ligand is 400 dalton and the density of the sensor chip surface is 5000 IU. So what is that? So to achieve an R mass so we need to immobilize enough ligand so that when the protein binds to it the resulting signal will reach 2000 we can use the following equation so we need to have used this following equation that is r max equal to <coughs> into molecular weight into n divided by 1000 into d the surface concentration of the ligand in molecules per square molecular weight is the molecular weight n is the avogadro number and d is the thickness of the adsorbed layer so that we, uh, <coughs> after rearranging the equations so R max into 1000 into D by molecular weight into Avogadro's number. Then you need to put in the values 2000, 1000 into 1 nanometer, 400 delta is the uh, molecular weight. So D small d is 1 nanometer that has already been uh, mentioned. And 400 into that is 8.3 1 into 10 to the power minus 5 molecules per nanometer square. How much ligand to immobilize on the sensor strip surface? Into A into M into divided by 1000 into 1000. A is the surface area of the M is the molecular weight of the ligand. And the standard sensor strip size will be on 1 centimeter square. So 8.31 into 10 to the power minus 5. So that becomes your 3.32 around 3.3 nanogram of ligand you need to see. So hopefully you have uh, understood it. So the main major thing what I would like to is uh, this formula of the RMX where you need to find out that how much uh, uh, ligands you need to chip in uh, and need to immobilize so that you can get a particular response. So this was uh, so this was uh, regarding your SPR. So the session will continue till 5 p.m. So if you have any doubts or any questions, you can share.